would you stand with me? I'm reading from the 19th chapter of Luke. This is not the Christmas story, but this is where the Christmas story was headed. So as we read in Luke 19, beginning in verse 28, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this uh, passage of Scripture, representing one more step forward in the plan of salvation and redemption that you set in, set in motion the moment sin entered the world, and uh, in fact had planned it long before anything entered the world or before the world ever was. And here it is coming to fruition before our very eyes in this passage of Scripture. Give us understanding as we search it this morning. We pray for those who are not able to be here this morning because they're traveling or because of the cold. We just ask that you will keep them safe, that you will bless them. We pray for, Lord, this holiday time as we all enjoy the time together and time with family and friends. And yet we cannot help but think of those who have perhaps lost loved ones this year or in years past. And Christmas isn't quite the same, not here on earth as it maybe was at one time. We pray that you will... Lord, be their comfort in this time when they could be kind of lonely. We pray that they will all be able to look forward to that great day when we will celebrate this all with you in your presence, forever to be with you. How we look forward to that. Bless us then as we look into your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and uh, please join me in Luke 19 if you're not already there. Wonderful passage of Scripture, one of the most misunderstood in the Bible as well. Reminds me of the lady who got up one morning, um, just as she was waking up, you know, she realized, whoa, I forgot to put the trash out. And so she gets up, uh, she runs out, her hair is in curlers, she's got her old bathrobe on, you know, her, it's your worst nightmare, right? Her old slippers and everything. So she runs out and she hollers just as the truck's coming down the street. She says, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it too late for the garbage? And the guy says, nope, you're just in time. Hop right on in. <laughs> just showing that appearances can be deceiving, right? Appearances can be deceiving. I don't think she actually wanted to hop on in. But our text is like that this morning. This is often referred to, usually referred to, as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And at one level, it is that, a triumphal entry. It's probably called that in your Bible. But at a deeper level, the underlying meaning, it is not a triumphal entry at all. In fact, what should have been the greatest day in the history of Israel, what could have been, what should have been, had they accepted their Messiah, was in fact its worst nightmare. This is Jesus reaching the climax of his earthly ministry. This is Jesus finally offering himself to Israel as their king. This is them accepting him at one level outwardly, but not accepting him inwardly. And so within a few days, they will reject him Altogether, because he does not fit their idea of what the king should be. 
That's really been the trend for some time now in his ministry. People have come and gone. People have heard him, gotten all excited, and then gone home and left. The Pharisees have always been there in the background, the antagonists. And now they will lead the, they will lead the charge to an official, on the part of the nation, rejection of Jesus. Jesus has arrived in Bethany, where his friends, Martha Mary and Lazarus lived, as you will recall, it's about seven miles east of Jerusalem. For the next three days, he will come and go in the city of Jerusalem. He'll go in, and each morning he will come out each night. He is, at this point, offering himself as the long-awaited Messiah or anointed one. The Old Testament had three offices which required anointing, as most of you will remember. In fact, we talked about this, I believe, last Christmas the offices of prophet, priest, and king were all offices that required an anointing. Jesus is all in one. He's all three of them. He's the prophet, the ultimate prophet. He's the ultimate king, and he is the ultimate priest. And I love how G. Campbell Morgan pointed this out in one of his commentaries. Each one of the days that Jesus goes into Jerusalem during this last week of his life he offers himself first as king on the day that we will look at today. He offers himself the next day as priest when he goes in and cleanses the temple in Jerusalem. And he offers himself on the final day as the prophet because he takes on all of the oral arguments that people can throw against him and he wins them all. And yet in the end, the people reject him on all three levels. And by the fourth day, they are hollering for his crucifixion. Amazing turnaround, isn't it? because he wasn't who they thought he should be. Jesus was not the king that they wanted. He didn't look like they thought he should. He didn't act like they thought he would. And so they rejected him. He was accepted at first only on a surface level, and thus they missed the best thing that could have ever happened to them because they were deceived by appearances. And so we want to unpack this tragedy in four acts this morning. First of all, let's look at the fact that despite appearances, Jesus is the King of Kings. Despite appearances, Jesus is the King of Kings. Up until now, if you've been following along in the book of Luke, Jesus has been refusing all attempts to identify him as the Messiah or as the king. Every time somebody wants to mention that, he basically tells them to go home and be quiet about this. When he heals people, he tells them to go home and don't tell anyone. So he's been, in one sense, kind of hiding this in a way. But now, at long last, he is encouraging the very thing that he's been discouraging all along. Why? Very simple, because the time has come. Because the time is right. Throughout the book of John, it keeps saying, because his hour had not yet come, because his hour had not yet come. But now, the hour has come. So the time is right. And so Jesus offers himself to Israel as the king. And the people here on the surface at the beginning are hollering out. They're hollering out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quotation directly from the 118th Psalm, which applies to the Messiah. Undoubtedly, these, these were a lot of visitors who were in Jerusalem at this time for the Feast of the Passover, but it's also some of the people who lived there. They are desperately wanting this to be true. And so they were coming out and accepting him as king, but they are only accepting him as the king that they wanted. They are not accepting him for who he really is. And that's why we will see we'll run into to problems very quickly. Now, let's face it, at one, in one sense, Jesus doesn't look much like a king as he's riding into Jerusalem that day, does he? I mean, contrast this with uh, Queen Elizabeth II in England when she was uh, got, going to her coronation in 1953. She's riding in a gold carriage. There are hundreds of horses and soldiers and bands going before her and after her in her procession to be coronated as the Queen of England. That's what a king should look like, right? Jesus riding on this little donkey coming into town certainly didn't look much like a king. 
we find it confused even his closest disciples. Read in John chapter 12, verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. They wanted him as king too. They thought that's what was going to happen in Jerusalem on this occasion. They were looking forward to that. But here he comes riding into town on a donkey, and as you'll see in verse 41, he's coming into town weeping. Hardly a triumphal entry. I can only imagine the disciples must have been thinking, what is this? You are, we thought you were going to be the king. I mean, you should be riding into town on a war horse, you know, with your sword drawn and rallying the people against the Romans. What is this riding on a donkey? I mean, you look like something out of Don Quixote, you know, Sancho Panza or something. Riding his donkey around the countryside. They didn't get it until later because compared to what they would have thought, he didn't look like a king. He didn't act like a king either. The next day, when he went into town, he went straight to the temple and he threw out the merchants and the people that were making money, the commerce people in the temple. In other words, instead of attacking the Romans, which is what they expected, he attacked his own people. He didn't act much like a king. He's driving out his own people. Nothing like what they expected. Is it any wonder that five days later, four days later, they were crying out, crucify him? It's not who they thought he would be. They wanted a king they controlled. They wanted a king that would be a king after their own image, a king who would correspond to their own wicked hearts. And Jesus is not that king, so they killed him. But I'll tell you what, beloved, Jesus is God's king, right? Jesus is God's king. They should have known that, the disciples most of all. They should have remembered Zechariah 9, where it was prophesied. Zechariah 9, verse 9, Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? And here's Jesus doing exactly that. In fact, Luke does what he often does. He just mentions one thing or one person like he does the blind man when there were actually there were two or the man that was in the Gadarenes. There were actually two. Matthew tells us in Matthew 21 verse 2 that there was actually a, a donkey and the foal of that donkey that were in this parade. So there were two of them, exactly what Zechariah had prophesied. Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy exactly as it was prophesied. The disciples might have also remembered, had they been thinking about this, that Solomon rode to his coronation on a donkey. Now, he wasn't setting a precedent by doing that, but there was a reason for that in the case of Solomon. You may remember that David was the warrior king. David was the one who wanted, who had, who had brought the kingdom together. David was the one that God had used to drive out many of those that should have been driven out hundreds of years before when Joshua first went into the land, but that were not. David was the one who had united the empire. And then he turned around and he wanted to build a house for God. Remember that? He brought the, he brought the the Ark of the Covenant back to the city, and now he wanted to build the temple to put it in. And God said, no, you're not going to build the temple. You're a man of blood. But your son, he will build the temple. Which is exactly what happened. So in the coronation of Solomon, the son who was going to build the temple, here is Solomon riding into town, not as the warrior, but as the man of peace, as the king of peace. And he builds the temple. And at the dedication of the temple... The, the presence of God is present in that, in that cloud that was there from the, from the time that the children of Israel had been delivered from Egypt. And that cloud was visible to the people as they were dedicating the temple. And as Solomon prayed, it went into the temple and it stayed there for the next 300 years. 
representing the presence of God. So Solomon is symbolically bringing the presence of God to the people because he's a man of peace. And here comes Jesus, the fulfillment of Solomon, the greater than Solomon, the king of peace, riding on a donkey, bringing not peace symbolically, but bringing peace actually through his death and resurrection, right? Here's the king of peace. Here's the real thing. Solomon only pointed forward to this king coming humbly, coming with righteousness, coming to bring righteousness for anyone. He didn't come to cast out the Romans, beloved. He came to cast out sin and death and Satan because if he didn't, no one would. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.14 that by his death, which he has come into Jerusalem to accomplish, by his death, he killed the one who has the power over death, even the devil. This is strength in weakness. Jesus' disciples didn't get this, but if Jesus came into town wielding the sword and trying to kick the Romans out, and even if he succeeded, he still didn't accomplish what he really needed to accomplish, which was to provide eternal life, which was to provide forgiveness and righteousness for people who didn't deserve it. The king of peace. But it took the ultimate in strength to do that, strength that was demonstrated in weakness as he went to the cross, as he suffered the humiliation there, as he looked like he was completely defeated when actually he was the victor. Strength and weakness. The king of peace. He's God's king. Let me tell you, he'll look a little different the next time he rides into Jerusalem. Revelation 19. I know you guys, Jesse hasn't quite got you there, I understand, because I sat in on it this morning. You're only in chapter 3. I, I, about the year 2025, I think you'll get there to Revelation 19. So here we are. You know what, I can't, am I on? Am I, it sounds like, okay, so we're good, all right. Usually I can tell and I can't, so. Revelation 19, listen to this, beginning in, beginning in verse uh, 11. Here's John pointing forward to the future. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Hey, think about that. Earth and sky are fleeting, fleeting, fleeing away from this person? What kind of person is this? I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in 20. I want to get in 19. I didn't, it wasn't sounding quite right. Let's go to 19. <clears throat> it was good, though, wasn't it? We could, could read the rest of that. Revelation 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven and opened, and behold, a white horse. This is after, you know, at least 2,000 years that we know of now, right? That we've been waiting for the coming of Christ. We keep saying, he's going to come, he's going to come, he's going to come. Maybe today. Maybe today. The day will come. I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So he's not coming as the king of peace the next time. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The blood that he suffered the first time came to Jerusalem. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, and white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's you, if you're a Christian. That's you. You and I will be there, following him. Imagine that. Here we come. From his mouth, verse 15, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty, on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God. O eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free, both free and, and slave, both great and small. And I saw the beasts 
and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs with which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. There's, it's a great warning here, by the way. Jesus isn't the only one that does signs and miracles. So will those in the end times who are leading the people to destruction. Beloved, Be careful. Look what he says. And then he says, he says, These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. It'll be different when Jesus comes again. He came the first time to bring peace, to bring comfort, to bring forgiveness, to bring cleansing, to bring freedom from guilt for those who will believe in him. But for those who will not repent, when he is done, this is what the end will be for those who turn away. And at that day, it won't even just be Rome that he will be delivering his people from. It will be every earthly power that has ever dared to come against them. Jesus will be delivering. Jesus will be coming a little differently, but he will have those with him because they have been saved by the grace of what he did the first time. Had he not done that, there would be no second coming. There would be no one to come with him. No one who could have stood before God except in his righteousness. So what that means is, beloved, that, that what that generation of Jews missed, we can have. What they wanted and thought they were going to get, but weren't willing to go through the process of repentance and submission to God in order to get it, we can have the freedom from guilt and sin and death, but also the political rulership of Jesus we can be part of. But Jesus must be king of your heart before he can become king of your world. So he is the king of kings. There's no doubt about that. The question is, is he your king? Will he be your king forever? That's the question. Despite appearances, he's the king of kings. Secondly, despite appearances, Jesus has all authority. He has all authority. He didn't look so much like it that day, riding on this little donkey. He did, certainly didn't look like it a week later when he lay stone cold dead in the tomb after they killed him. Killed because they did, he didn't follow their script. But despite appearances, Jesus has all authority. He didn't stay in that tomb. He's been demonstrating that he has all authority with every miracle that he ever performed, including raising people from the dead. Jesus has all authority. All authority. There's no authority that Jesus doesn't have. It all belongs to him. It's all in his hands. Jesus has all authority. He has authority over nature. He's already displayed that. First miracle was what? Turning water into wine. Can you do that? You can put the grape juice out there and let it sit for a while, but you can't turn water into wine, can you? You can't do that. None of us can do that. Only God can do that. Jesus calmed the storm when the disciples were out there in the middle of the storm, you remember, and they were amazed what kind, of, what kind of man are we with that he could calm the storms? He just says, peace be still in the waters like it never had a wave in it. Jesus has demonstrated his power over nature by feeding 5,000 people, men, plus women and children with five loaves and two fish. Another time he did 4,000 men and plus women and children with seven loaves and two fish. Jesus has power over nature. We see it here kind of subtly in this passage. I think it's interesting. Did you notice this in verse 30? Jesus, uh, Luke makes mention that Jesus sent his disciples after a colt, and they brought one on which no one has ever yet sat. Now, there's a couple things we should learn from that. Number one, this is a colt that hasn't been used because that's worthy of a king. It's not using something that's been used before, something that hasn't been used. But here's the other issue. Have you ever sat on a cold in which no one has ever sat before? Did you ever try? I have. Mostly calves, actually. The dad kept telling us, don't sit on those calves. You know, you're going to hurt them. But we used to do that. I'll tell you what, they don't just stand still. They don't just do what you want and go where you point them. What's the point? 
Jesus has authority over nature. Because Jesus has all authority. You see it later in this passage. Look at verse 39. Some of, the, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, <clears throat> if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Is that an exaggeration? Perhaps. Probably. But I'll tell you what, it reflects a great truth. If Jesus wanted them to cry out, they'd cry out, right? Because he has authority over nature. We... We think of salvation in very personal terms, very human terms, I think, right? We forget that the fall infected not just us as human beings, but it affected all of creation. The Bible teaches that, the thistles and the thorns and all the stuff that come up that you don't like. Why do you get those? Because nature has been infected. The fall broke everything. That's why Paul says in Romans that all of nature, not just human existence, but nature itself was made to glorify God, and now it's broken, and it can't do it as well as it might have been able to do. And so Romans 8, 19 says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of man. Their, it, nature's waiting just like we are for the second coming of Christ, for the redemption that comes when he comes so that it can fulfill its potential. It too was corrupted. It too was touched by the sin that has happened. And the Bible tells us that, you know, when Jesus comes, the rocks are going to cry out. They're going to dance. And if the, I mean, if the stones and the rocks are doing that, imagine what we're going to be doing. What he's saying is that nature has has a purpose to fulfill that it hasn't been able to fulfill yet. But when Christ comes and unleashes the tremendous transforming power that he has, nature will be able to fulfill its full potential, as will the people who belong to him, the ones who are in Christ. Jesus has authority over all things. He has authority over people. We've seen that multiple times throughout the life of Christ. And here we see it again. He sends the disciples to get this colt. The owners give up this valuable possession at the mere request that the Lord needs it. Why? Because he has authority over people. He says they found it exactly like he said they would find it. But I'll tell you who else is under his control. It's the very people that are going to kill him. They're under his control. They're under his control. By now, they've decided he has to go. The Jews, they're frantic to kill Jesus by this time. They're in hidden meetings, running uh, uh, scenarios to figure out how are we going to kill this guy. And they've determined this, according to Matthew 26. Listen to this. As the Passover approaches, Matthew 26, 5, we says, Matthew tells us, but they, that's the religious leaders, they said, not during the feast lest there be a great uproar among the people. So they want to kill him, but not now. That, but that's a problem. Why? Because the time is now. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because Jesus is the final fulfillment of all those sacrifices, millions and millions that have been made over the years that point forward to the one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice, therefore, has to be made on the Passover. And here are Jesus' enemies deciding, yeah, we want to kill him, but not on the Passover. So what happens? Jesus rides into town on the colt, the foal of the donkey, and the people acclaim him. And Judas comes and betrays him as had been prophesied in the Old Testament. Yes, because Satan entered him, but only because God allowed that and superintended that. And now he comes to these men who were going to wait and kill him later. And he says, I'll tell you where to find him. And suddenly they realize we got to do this now or never. This massive display of public acclaim forces the hand of these leaders. Their authority is being undermined because the authority of Jesus predominates. It always does. I don't know who you are this morning or what you think you're getting away with or where you think you are fooling God. I just want to tell you you're not. His authority is absolute. God always wins. We'll see that in just a moment. 
Jesus' authority is absolute, and his authority over these men is absolute, they finally kill him on God's timetable. So that as thousands of lambs are out there being killed and sacrificed for Passover, the Lamb of God is being killed as the sacrifice for our sin, as the payment for our sin, for the penalty of our sin, to fulfill what they were symbolizing he is doing in reality. He has all authority. The timetable is always God's, not man's. Solomon knew that. He said in Proverbs 16, uh, I think it's 32, he says, he says, the lot is cast into the lap, but the, its ever decision is from the Lord. What he's saying is you throw the dice, but God's the one who makes the numbers come up. God's the one who superintends every move we make. All authority belongs to him. That's why Paul can say so confidently, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. It doesn't look like it. The cross didn't look good, right? How could you look at the cross and say, hey, there's God displaying his love and his mercy? But it was. The worst thing that God allows is good for those who love him. Now, there's no promise for those who don't love God except the promise of judgment. But for those who love God, he says, all things work together for good. All things, everything, all works together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. That's why he told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. It may not look like it right now. It may not seem like it at the moment. All authority is in the hand of Jesus. Everything is going exactly the way he wants it to go. The timetable is exactly what he wants it to be. Jesus has all authority. I want to tell you, that's a great truth to live by, isn't it? Every move in my life, everything that happens, even my own sin, if I love the Lord, God's going to use that somehow for his glory and for my good. He has all authority. Thirdly, despite appearances... Jesus requires total submission. In some ways it looks like you could take him or leave him. It's never the case. This has been made evident by Jesus all along. You'll recall that he told the disciples back in Luke 9, verse 23, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's a total commitment that is required to be a follower of Jesus. And now by this outward <clears throat> excuse me, by this outward public acceptance as king in David's line. Jesus is now drawing a line in the sand. This is part of what this entry into Jerusalem is. This is the line in the sand. Yes, you're right. I am the king. I am in the line of David. I am the one that God has sent. Now you must choose. Will you be with me or will you be against me? But I demand total submission if you're going to be on my side. If you love God, if you want to revere him, I am his instrument. I am God. His identity is the issue here. Is he really who he says he is or is he just who you want him to be? These people are accepting him for who they want him to be, but they're going to crucify him shortly because he's not who they wanted him to be. But this indifference is no longer an option. Jesus, by this entry into town, is basically saying you're going to have to king me or kill me. One or the other. Crown me or kill me. Those are the only two options. There, are no, there is no third option, and every individual has to make that decision. He's basically saying by this entry to these people, listen, I, I can and I will be your deliverer. I will be your king. I will be your redeemer. I will be your healer. I will be your friend. I can be your shepherd. I will be everything you need but you must submit to my authority. Now, the Bible teaches that every day, some, someday everybody will submit to the authority of Jesus. Isn't that what Paul says in Philippians 2? The day will come, we'll, we'll get to it in our memory section shortly, but ev when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, everyone. But some of them will do that after they've already died, after their opportunity for salvation is already over be too late. 
the time to accept the authority and submit to the authority of Jesus is now. Well, the time is right. I must either be the king of your heart or you must kill me. You cannot, you know, and the message to us is the same as it was to these people. You cannot just, Jesus is saying, you know what he's saying by this? You can't just like me. You can't just say, there goes a, a nice guy. I really like that Jesus. He said some really interesting things. I like to ponder some of those, you know? No, no, that's not what this is about at all. When Jesus went to the cross, which he's on his way to as he goes into this triumphal entry in Jerusalem, the fact that he went to the cross means you are, and all of us are at a point of decision. We must either crown him or we must kill him. He's saying, I must be your king or you must become part of the execution squad. There is no middle ground. There's no middle ground. I demand all authority be given to me, and I demand your submission if you're going to belong to me with his death and resurrection. See, there's no uh, religious, other religious leaders, you can take them or leave them. If you like something Buddha says about the sound of the clapping of one hand, I mean, be my guest. That tells you something. But you, but, you, but you can take him or leave him. You can't do that with somebody who died for your sins. Jesus forces the question of his identity on all of us. I love the, theologian Michael Bird, he's an Australian, um, Australian uh, theologian. He says, he says this, he says, everything I knew about Christianity growing up came from Ned Flanders. I think that's the guy on The Simpsons. Is that right? I don't, I've never watched that show, but I think that's who that is. Anybody know? Is that it? Okay, yeah, I'm getting a lot of nods. Okay. Uh, Ned Flanders, he said, everything I knew about Christianity, and I'm, I assume it's not particularly good if you got it from Ned Flanders. That's my assumption. I don't know. He says, everything I knew about Christianity I got from Ned Flanders. And then he says, at the high school graduation ceremony, though, Chaplain Graham told us, the most important question you will ever ask is, who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Is he a lunatic, a liar, or is he Lord? Now, you know what's interesting to me is that Jesus, in spite of the fact that Christianity, while it is the fastest growing religion in the world, by the way, still the most prosperous religion in the world, Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds, and not necessarily in our country, but in lots of other places in the world. Today, the latest statistics out of Boston University and other places show that it's growing faster than anyone. Jesus is known, beloved, and he is revered in almost every religion. Did you know that? Now, sometimes they call him a great prophet. They deny his deity, but they know him. Here's my point. People know the name of Jesus. They know who Jesus is. What they, what they will not realize and what they will not acknowledge is that it matters that you get him right. You must get him right. Is he lunatic, a liar, or Lord? That's the only choices. He can't be just a nice guy because his claims didn't allow for that. Somebody that comes along saying, I'm God, you can't just say, well, that's a nice guy. You're going to call him a lunatic, or you're going to say, well, maybe he really is, right? But you're gonna, you, can't, you can't go in the middle. Jesus didn't leave that option. Bird says this, he says, I rolled my eyes at the time, but the question stuck. Who is Jesus and what is all the fuss about? Years later, as a paratrooper, I came to the decision that Jesus was definitely Lord. Have you come to that decision? Is he your Lord? He needs to be our Lord, right? Despite appearances, Jesus is the King of Kings. Despite appearances, Jesus has all authority. And despite appearances, Jesus demands total submission. Finally, despite appearances, Jesus is rejected here. This crowd seems to accept him. They seem overwhelmingly enthusiastic. Estimates are that uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived in the time of Christ before and after, he says that during the time of the Passover, as many as a million to two million people would come to Jerusalem. He says that Jerusalem consisted of about 80,000 residents at that point in time. It's a little bit like a football game in Lincoln, Nebraska, right? Same kind of deal. A lot more people come to town and are in town than actually live there. 
Well, I, the numbers are probably exaggerated. Everybody agrees Josephus exaggerates almost everything, and so the numbers are probably exaggerated. But even if they're half that, even if there's 500,000 people that come to town at the time of the Feast of the Passover, and even if only 40,000 people live there, there's a lot of people in town while this is going on. And they've come out to see this Jesus. They've, all, they've heard different things about him. Different people have different ideas because of what may have come to their ears, but they're coming out because all the Jews were looking for the Messiah. This was the biggest thing on the agenda for them. This was on their, next, their timetable for the next thing to happen was for their Messiah to come. They all wanted him to be the Messiah. They would tend to go after false messiahs from time to time. And so as this new one comes to town, their enthusiasm is at a, a fever pitch, and here they come to acclaim him, to put their cloaks on the road, it's the red carpet treatment. Luke doesn't tell us this, but Matthew does, that they were laying down palm branches indicating their acceptance of him as somebody very important. You know, in those days, a celebrity coming to town was, you know, better than big screen television. That's, that's all you had to do. So you went out to see him, and they are, they've all come. The problem is they accepted him for who they wanted him to be, not for who he really is. At the end of the week, that was a big problem. And so disaster lurks just beneath the surface. Turn, turn with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. What's happened is Jesus has come to, you know, John 12, remember, even though it seems like it's in the middle of John, the next several chapters are taken up with an account of the last night that Jesus had with his disciples. So in John 12, we're there. We're at the time of his last visit to Jerusalem. And in John 11, you'll remember he's, John gives us the information that he, when he came to Bethany, one of the things that had happened was that Lazarus had died. Remember that? And so Jesus came, and one of the things he did was heal his, heal his friend Lazarus like a week before he's going to be crucified. He raises him from the dead. Well, you don't raise somebody from the dead, even in those days without the internet, that word doesn't get around, right? And so word had gotten around. And so we come to John 12, and uh, beginning in verse 17, John 12, beginning in verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Why were they there? Because they wanted to worship Jesus? Well, there were a few true believers in that crowd, yes, but most of them were fire engine chasers. They were there for the spectacle. They were there hoping to see some other great miracle of some kind. And of course, the greatest of their expectations would be that this really is the Messiah, and he really is going to kick the Romans out like we expect him to do. But that's why they were there, because the word had gotten around that he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they wanted to come and see for themselves. But the Pharisees, who represent the nation as a whole, they come in verse 39, and they say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And despite appearances, this is the official rejection of Jesus. I want to show you that. Not next week, we won't be here, but two weeks from now. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say don't miss it, but you know, half of you aren't here. So hopefully <laughs> those who aren't will come back or you'll listen to it if you're, if you're gone. I get it because you'll want to hear it. But the, the rejection of Jesus is so clear as we look at it in more detail in a couple of weeks. But this is the last appearance here of these en enemies of Christ, the Pharisees. And they say, what, are, what is their last statement? Rebuke your disciples. What are they saying? Your disciples are saying you're the king, you're in the line of David, you're the Messiah. Rebuke them. In other words, you're not, you know you're not the king. You know you're not the Messiah. Stop acting like God. That's what they're saying. They're saying get down off this high horse. Who do you think you are? It just takes those few words to reject Jesus. It doesn't take a lot to reject Jesus. Jesus does it. Just refuse to acknowledge him as the God-man, and you've rejected the one and only hope that you will ever have for salvation, right? 
The Bible says this is salvation, John 17, 3, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The two are linked. You can't separate them. People constantly want to do this. Well, I believe in God, but Jesus, you know, he's okay. He's a good man, not God, not according to Scripture. You can't separate them. And so these men are doing that. They're symbolic of what's going on behind the scenes where the nation's leaders are preparing to lead the charge against Jesus and to kill him. And what's Jesus' reaction to all this wild acclaim? Verse 41, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He wasn't joining in the hollering and the celebrating and all the rest of it that was going on. Why? Because he knew it was only on the surface. He knew the wild enthusiasm was for his miracle working power. It had nothing to do with them really wanting him. He knew it would all turn murderous by the end of the week. Jesus knew crowds. He knew that the fact that he would not bend to their definition of his identity, that he would not be who they wanted, that he would not be the deliverer from Rome, the political deliverer that they wanted here and now before they had spiritual deliverance. He knew that they would reject him and kill him because of that, because he would not march to the beat of their drum. It's all downhill from here. Crowds are fickle. This one was no exception. But let me conclude with this. There is great hope in this passage of Scripture. There's great hope in this passage of Scripture. The hope is this. What Jesus' rejectors meant for evil, God turned to good. This is Genesis 50:20 and Romans 8:28 all being played out in living color again. The message of the Bible from beginning to end, whatever Satan means for evil, God means for good. Whatever Satan does that's wrong, God turns into something good somehow, some way. We don't see it all. We don't know how it all turns out yet, but we will one day. And here's another instance of that. Their refusal, their refusal in rejecting Jesus is going to be what? It's going to be the thing that sends him to the cross eventually. It's going to be the thing that crucifies him. But that is what has to happen for the plan of redemption to be effected, right? And so the rejection of these people becomes the salvation of us. This pulls immediately into the 21st century. Were it not for their rejection from a human perspective, we would have no salvation. Now, don't get me wrong, God would have had plenty of ways he could affect that had they not done this. But their rejection is our salvation if we will accept the provision that Jesus made. Jesus says in John 12, 32, if you're just still in John 12, and when I, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Their rejection is our, is our salvation. That's what he's doing today. Just as he entered Jerusalem, he's asking to enter your heart and your life, Right? Just as he asked to be their king, he's asking to be your king. Just as they rejected him, you have the option, will you reject him or will you accept him? Be one of those who accepts him. The question is, what will we do with this life that he offers? There's a a section in in C.S. Lewis' Narnia Chronicles where these kids, you know, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, they all end up in this in this place where there's animals that talk and all this kind of stuff, representing spiritual truth. And uh, the, great, the great spiritual leader there is Aslan the lion, who, of course, is representative of Christ, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a great picture of Jesus. And early on in this, in this first book, Lewis writes this. One of the girls, oh, Susan says, I thought he was a man when, they, when she heard the name Aslan. She said, is he quite safe? I shall feel anxious about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you, and he's good. 
He's not safe, beloved. Jesus has never been safe, but he's good. The day will come when if we reject him, we will have condemned ourselves. He will just implement what we have chosen, but he is infinitely good. As we accept him as king by faith, he will forgive, he will cleanse, he will save, and we can turn the rejection of this crowd into a triumphal entry into our hearts. That's how you turn rejection into a triumphal entry. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for, for the word. It's really, Lord, in many ways, it's unthinkable that you've gone through what you've gone through in order to provide salvation for us. Why would you ever expose yourself? Why would you ever become a man, first of all, with the limitations that implies? But then to expose yourself to all of this, when you could have, in a moment of time, just stopped it all, just put an end to it. But you did not. You went through it all because you were strong enough to take the humiliation and death that was coming in order to provide salvation for us. We are forever grateful. And we thank you for that. Lord, we, now as we celebrate this time of year and as we celebrate this is the reason why you came, I pray that that will be clear to all of us. As we sing this last hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and we remember again what it meant for you to become one of us so that we could be one with you. We thank you so much. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.